تو کوتو رو داشی شوتو رو مرم با بابا خاطر رو دخوت و شوتو رو برم خند رو داشی نکی فالگاه شوتو رو برم با کورم برم نهار رو داشو Holy Spirit, we just thank you for your presence. Father, just let our flesh get out of the way. We just cast all our worries and cares on you. <sighs> thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your purposes in our life. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity to minister the word and to pour into these amazing men's lives <clears throat> these men that have amazing potential <clears throat> you got awesome plans for them to transform the world around them Lord just equip us to be able to equip them in Jesus name Amen Amen hmm. Sometimes all you need is just a little prayer in your life. <laughs> in air conditioning room. Something I was going to say earlier. This is beside the point. But I feel like I need to say it anyway. So this is not my teaching. Who knows, maybe it'll become the teaching. Excellence. Versus critical. I don't know if this is how you say it. Criticalness. What's a better word for that? Criticism. Over critical. Criticism. Huh? Overbearing. Excellent. I want to be this, but I don't want to be this. You know what I'm saying? I want to be excellent. But I don't want to be in the pursuit of excellence, destroy everybody through being overcritical. Oh, exasperated. Exasperative. Maybe that's what it's kind of like the Bible says fathers don't <coughs> provoke your children. <clears throat> excellence is so important. You've got to be excellent in everything you do. If you don't, you're not adequately worshiping. Scripture very clearly says, do everything as unto the Lord. Yeah, let's find it. Do everything as unto the Lord. Colossians 3.23, right here. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Okay? There's another trans... Uh, okay, right here. Bond servants. Right here. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with, sincere, with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Okay? Now here, it's talking about slaves and masters. But in modern times, we, we don't have, you know, not in America at least, we don't have slaves and masters. We have employees and employers, right? Or we have, does it make sense? So this here, it says bond servant. Now, bond servant is, is a person who binds themselves to someone else for labor, for work, okay? But this isn't just when you go to work. This is every area of your life. Everything should be done in excellence, okay? Everything should be done in excellence, Oftentimes, you know, we get in a hurry to do things. When you get things done, you know, sometimes we cut corners. Cutting corners is not, that's not excellence. You know what I mean? You want to make sure you do things right. You know, ask a lot of questions. We don't want to get into the point where we're in an analysis paralysis, is what I call it. Analysis paralysis is whenever you overthink something to the point of no execution. Analysis paralysis is when you overthink something to the point of no execution, all right? But on the other hand, <clears throat> you want to critically think what 
this criticalness that you have. You know, we talk about we don't want to be overbearing and overcritical. Sometimes you have to have somebody in your life that's a bit critical because you don't know how to be self-critical. Now we get to the point where people are like, well, you don't want to be so critical of yourself that you always beat yourself up either. So there's like these balances of truth. If you have no critical thinking, then you're not able to look for problems, perceive them, and develop solutions. Make sense? If you can't critically think and always look for your error, always look for ways to improve, then, then you'll never actually solve problems. So, again, there's a balance of being extremely critical of yourself, okay? I don't like, people don't like to use that word, critical, but criticism is not bad. Criticism teaches you how to become more excellent. Make sense? Mm. It's like being examined. You're being examined. Yeah, examining yourself. Judge. Yeah, judge yourself, right? It's so critical. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> but critical thinking, if you don't have critical thinking, then you don't perceive problems. But some people are so critical, all they see is problems and never solutions. If you, if you can't, if you can't be, have critical thinking to the point where you actually come up with solutions, if the end result of your criticalness is not solutions-based, yeah. then you are too critical. Okay? If you're always pointing out flaws in other people, but you're never actually helping them become better, okay, then you're going to become overbearing. Make sense? Sometimes people don't know how to be critical of themselves. Or maybe they're so critical of themselves, they're always afraid of failure. Okay? Maybe there's a balance. Maybe, there's a, maybe they fall in one side of the, uh, one ditch or the other. Right? So, I mean... But the truth is, let's put it this way. If you ever get to the point where you despise correction, then the Bible says that you're stupid. Stupid is not lack of intelligence. Stupidity is hate of correction. <laughs> Whoa. This Proverbs 12 one. Is it? <laughs> Proverbs 12.1. He who hates discipline. Huh? <laughs> there you go. Whoever loves discipline, loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. I got corrected the other day from somebody who doesn't even spend any time with me at all. I would, In fact, he even spoke evil about me one time. This guy came and corrected me. And man... Did I have to do a heart check? You know? <laughs> Jonah hated the people in Assyria, but they repented. So if, if Assyria can repent from a man who hates them, I can also repent when a man who hasn't done a very good job loving me corrects me. Oh. Powerful stuff. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, it always helps if somebody loves you. I, I just found, though, that it's not really for their benefit that you love them. It's for your own benefit that you love them. Because you'll be judged for not loving them. Yeah. So anyway, a guy came, came up to me and corrected me. And I had to, my pride swelled up, you know. But I had to just like, ooh, I just had to end up texting the guy. After I said, well, thank you. I appreciate you. Uh, before I even left, before darkening, I immediately humbled my heart and said, well, I appreciate you talking to me, you know. And then later I texted him and said, I really want you to know I'm thankful for people like you in my life who have the boldness and courage to come and talk to me about things because there aren't a lot of people that do that with me. You know what I mean? So if I have people that are willing to do that, you know, and I think that that guy really had my best interest in mind. It's just that he didn't have a good track record in the past. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and so what I did was, when I told him, thank you, I, what I did was I opened the door of invitation to come and do it again. See what I'm saying? 
If you love correction, you'll invite it again. <laughs> it's powerful. Hate correction. If you hate correction, you're stupid. the Bible says, but if he hate, who hates reproof is stupid. Another uh, verse, uh, Bible scholar, let me know if you find it before Google, um, <laughs> Dre, <laughs> uh, is, know, it, it says, he who hates discipline uh, despises himself. You know where that one is? Come on, Dre. Proverbs 15, 32. Whoever ignores instruction despises himself, but he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. So, this is powerful stuff. Um, if we have uh, if we have the ability to receive instruction, then we actually love ourselves. He says right here, he despises himself ignores instruction or hates it. So when somebody corrects you and you get upset about it, you know, the Bible is teaching us that we hate ourselves. I think it's because we hate ourselves that we despise correction. Let me put it this way. If you already hate yourself and I come to you and, and correct you on something, all I'm doing is confirming your worst fears. That makes sense? So it's really insecurity. It's really insecurity. When people can't receive correction, it's because they're insecure. When people are humble and receive correction, this always leads to confidence. The scripture says, he who humbles himself, God will exalt. So if you want to be confident, the, the number one way to become confident is to become humble, which seems opposite. Right. Make sense? All right, so excellence and criticalness. I wanted to talk about these two things briefly and just say, I want to be excellent. But the real way to be excellent is not to be critical. The real way to be excellent is to teach others how to be self-critical, not to a self-defeat point of view, not to, not to, the, ends, not to the end result of self-defeat, but to the end result of simply never being satisfied and always wanting to improve, okay? Is your, your goal in life is not to be satisfied. Your goal in life is to become better than yesterday. And if you're never satisfied, then you always say, hey, I got something to work on. Make sense? <coughs> so, yeah, our biggest, our, our biggest, you know, uh, I mean, I think a lot of times we do worry about being adequate, you know? Um, but that's more like a, that keeps us from starting. If we don't feel adequate, we don't even start. Yeah. But if we, if we started, then our fear is failure. Yes. Um, <clears throat> but you never fail if you always learn from your mistakes. It's when you don't learn from your mistakes that you utterly fail. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't remember, uh, there's this one quote that says, um, uh, there's nothing, nothing uh, worse than, uh, learn, that, that there's nothing wor worse than uh, making mistakes it's ex except not learning from those mistakes. Or nothing more painful than making mistakes except not learning from those mistakes is more painful. You know, I'm still botching it up. The only thing more, I think it is, the only thing more painful than making mistakes is not learning from them. That's what it is. The only thing, let's write it down. The only thing... Somebody's phone ringing? TV. Oh, something's buzzing. Oh, okay. The only thing more painful than making mistakes is not learning from them. <clears throat> make sense? Mm -hmm. The only thing more painful than make, making mistakes is not learning from them. So we want to go to excellence. The only way you can become excellence is if that criticalness gets into your own heart or you're self-critical. And again, I'm not trying to get to that point where we're so defeated. It's not what I'm talking about. 
I'm saying, if you ever believe that your work is good enough, it's not. Amen. And if you can, and again, people are say, Zach, you can't think like that. I can't think like that. It's the reason why we accomplish what we accomplish. I've accomplished what I accomplished because to me, it's never good enough. If it is good enough, then, then I'm always going to settle for less and I'm never going to push for more. Amen. See what I'm saying? If you want people to never grow past their ceiling of success, if you, never, if, you never, if you don't want people to go beyond their last level of success, then tell them they did a good job. Now, that's, that's weird because we think, well, we need to be encouraging. Well, you do need to be encouraging. But if you want someone to go beyond where they went last time, don't tell them good job. I mean, you can tell them good job because people do need to be encouraged. I tell my people, you can always tell these people, I tell people here, good job, okay? So I, it's not like I'm not an advocate for encouragement. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I'm also an advocate for excellence and always demand more. So there's been people who work for me before who cut and cut that so they leave. Because people sometimes just want to come and just coast. You can't coast. Not here. Make sense? Mm -hmm. We want to constantly be, be climbing. It's okay, to, uh, it's okay to encourage people, but if you keep saying it over and over, <clears throat> good job, good job, good job, they just settle for that, what they've done yeah. in the past. So for every task, if they say good job on a test, they did just mainly half of what they could have done, they're like, oh, well, I only do half. Then yeah. Every time. An, encur an encourager will tell you that you did a good job, but a coach will also tell you not only what you did good at, but will also tell you what you need to improve on. Always. My dad, my dad would come in my room, and, you know, and he'd say, "Clean up your room." So I'd clean up the room, and every time there wasn't one time my dad came into my room and said, "You did a good job." <laughs> And that was it. He would say, he would always come in and say, well, you missed, you missed that piece of trash. Hey, uh, see those counters over there? You need to clean all that off. You need to take this up. Your, your, your bed should be tucked in. Why aren't your, your sheets put the right way? You know, always something. And if it was real bad, he'd just come in there and throw everything on the floor and say, this is how I feel about your room. Now get, now get to go and, and get it fixed right. <laughs> you know? Um, <clears throat> I'm not saying my dad never said the word. I'm not saying you should never say the words good job. Because I think then you're just going to be a, you know, a butt. <laughs> right? But if, if the people that you're leading and serving are never pushed to the next level, why are, they, why are you even helping them? Just leave them where they're at. Make sense? I used to have people working for me at CC's Pizza. I'd tell them, I'd say, what's the difference between instruction and correction? And uh, <clears throat> I did this in the interview process because I was looking for a person who, was, who could tell me the difference because I wanted to see if, who I was dealing with. Because almost without fail, I'd hire somebody, man, and you'd correct them and boom, they'd be upset. They'd be offended, whatever, right? I'm thinking, how can I run a team if I can't correct anybody? How can we get better if I can't correct anybody? Correction is a part of the process. And if you can't handle that, I don't need you on my team. You know, so I'd tell them, what's the difference between instruction and correction? They say, well, instruct, and so I, usually they don't know the difference. Instruction is the first time I tell you to do something. But correction is every conversation we have afterwards. You know, it's me telling you how to improve, how to do better. And I would tell them in the interview process, if you come work for me, I want you to know that I don't expect you to stay here forever. This is CC's Pizza. Unless you're, unless you're going to be uh, a manager one day, I don't expect you to stay here. I expect you to use this as a stepping stone to go to your next job. So while you're here, I'm going to teach you how to work hard. I'm going to teach you a, a, a spirit of excellence. And if you can't cut it here, you won't make it over in another job. You know? And so <clears throat> I said in the interview process, I'd tell them, if at any point, 
Is, is, if I correct you, it means I care about you. If I correct you, that means I want you on my team. If I correct you, it means I'm trying to develop you and, I've, and I'm, I'm taking ownership as a leader in your life to help you succeed. If at any point I stop correcting you, just know I'm looking for someone to replace you. <laughs> and that way it kind of set the tone, you know. And it helped me really, it really helped me uh, help, the, help them understand the relationship better, you know what I mean? So that they know this is part of the job, that you're going to be corrected. And so, <clears throat> anyway, my dad would come to me, you know, when he'd come and clean up that room. Thanks. Um, he'd come in the room and see the room, and after he corrected me, he'd say, <clears throat> Zach, um, I'm not trying to just be critical or mean. He'd tell me, I want you to have a spirit of excellence. If you don't have a spirit of excellence, you'll never succeed in your life. If you can't clean your room with excellence, you won't be able to get a job and keep a job. So I knew the reason why, the deeper reason why. It wasn't that my dad hated me or was angry at me or upset with me. It's that my dad loved me and wanted to develop me. Well, because of that, because every single time for 18 years of my life, you know, that I could feel, like I knew, it was, it was like I'd do a job and I always felt like my dad was looking over my shoulder. Like if he looked, if he came in the room, I wanted to make sure it looked good, you know? Obviously there were plenty of times where I, you know, played around, didn't do a good job, he showed up, and the reason why I didn't do a good job was just because I was playing around, period, end of story. It, was no, it wasn't that I didn't do a good job, I just didn't do the job. <laughs> you know what I mean? <clears throat> so there's, th there's still always this thing, even today, at this age, I always feel like someone's looking over my shoulder saying, what are you doing? Are you working? Are you doing your best? Uh, so anyway, we have um, this attitude and this spirit of excellence that you know my dad would always try to to do with me, and make sure that I had this thing inside my heart. You know what I mean? Anyway, so when I got when I went away, went home, went to went to college, and uh, got a job, this is how I operated. I always thought to myself, what if my dad was to walk in the room right now? You know what I mean? And so people might think this too critical, but to me it wasn't. It was he. It was like I had this voice in my head all the time. You see what I'm saying? And that's the way I am the way I am. You know, people... No, take that down. Let's redo that. You know? Oh, Zach. Why are we going to redo this? Because it was inbred in me as a kid all the way to adulthood. If you got to do it right, you got to do it right the first time. You know? So, anyway. That's really all I have to say about that. So, what we want to do is we want to get inside our heart a spirit of excellence. We want to get in our heart um, something that drives. What is driving you? I was talking to Dre this morning. Stop doing what people tell you to do. Do what you have to do. Do what you must do. Stop waiting for somebody else to tell you to do it. Do what you must Figure out the problem. Solve the problem. Make sense? Always look for problems. My dad would always tell me this. I'd say, oh, I just don't know where to start. You know, it's overwhelming. Look down at your feet. Find the thing at your feet and pick that up. The problem you're supposed to solve is right in front of you. Oftentimes, we just want to look past it and pretend it's not there. <laughs> See what I'm saying? But he'd say, look down, look right there. So I'd bend down and pick up that piece of underwear and go take it to the, and he'd say, and I'd turn around and just start coming back to that same spot. My dad would say, stop. Look down right where you're at. Pick that thing up. Okay, I pick that up and, see what I'm saying? And so the next thing you know, like, it's, why waste a trip traveling all the way across the room to find something else to do when there's something right there to solve too? <laughs> Come on. <clears throat> so... We have to have that spirit. Look, there's always a problem to solve. Always. And oftentimes we wait for somebody else to solve it. I call that the dirty diaper syndrome. You have a mother and a father, and they both have a kid, 
right? And that child comes in there, smells poopy. So one of the parents goes over there, oh, come give me a hug. And oh, golly, you stink. But what's he do? Go over there next to your mother. <laughs> Try to avoid the responsibility, you know? Instead of changing the diaper right then, right when you perceive the problem. My wife always asks me, Zach, will you change the diaper? I never ask my wife to change the diapers. If I smell a diaper, I change it. My wife's like, you don't ever change the diaper. No, you just don't know when I do because I don't tell you. You know what, next time I change the diaper, I'm gonna holler. Uh -huh. I'm changing the diaper! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just so you know! <laughs> <laughs> Nah, man, what we do is we pawn off the responsibility and we assume that other people don't want to do the work. You know the reason why, the, you know, do you want to know the real reason why we assume other people don't want to work? Because we don't want to. Because we don't want to work. We think everybody's like us. And I mean, 90% of the time it's true. We don't want to do the work. We want to avoid the work. So we assume everybody else is being lazy. I'll tell you what, I, I don't really assume people anymore don't want to do the work. I just get disappointed when it doesn't happen. It's like, dang it, man, I thought y'all were going to do this. You know? <clears throat> you got to start believing in people. People, if, if you're leading, the people that you're leading are always looking for affirmation. Okay? But they're also looking for truth, too. So if you don't tell somebody that they're doing a good job or even it's like this, you got to tell people what they are doing good. You got to tell them what they're not doing good. And then you got to tell them what you believe they can do. If you don't tell people what they, you believe that they can do, they won't believe they can. Unfortunately, most people are not driven like that. They need inspiration from a leader in their life to tell them, I believe you can do it. All right, if I, you know, we can go around and correct all kinds of things, but I really believe that developing people into this mind frame is really the most important thing. You got to create a culture of problem solving. If you're a leader, are you solving all the problems or are you empowering other people to solve problems? Well, they just can't do it as good as I can, Zach. That's because you didn't develop them. Because you didn't teach them. Mm -hmm. out of a job. Uh, the best leaders always work themselves out of a job. <clears throat> because your visionary leader is always going to have something for you to do. He'll figure it. I always tell people this. If a job really wants you, they'll make room for you. Nine times out of ten... If you're a really desirable worker, somebody just can't live without you, they'll make it happen. They'll make room for you. I mean, unless they just are absolutely in a financial bind and they're just not able to get you on the team. My point is <clears throat> that, you see what I'm saying? Because your most valuable asset is good workers, good leaders. That's your most valuable asset on a team. So if, you, if you're worth your salt, They'll make it happen for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And oftentimes you gotta be patient. Cause you might not you might go work for something or be somewhere and like, man, they haven't really made room for me yet. Just just wait. Sometimes you just gotta wait for the right thing to happen and then boom, then you can move in. But anyway, that's just beside the point. <clears throat> we work for a ministry which is slightly different, not totally different. You gotta be called. So I think over here, man, you've got to, you've got, if you're gonna operate in a spirit of excellence, you've got to create a culture of, I don't know, pulling it out from within you. If you're waiting for somebody to tell you to do something, then that's not really growth and excellence. Okay, excellence is beyond reactive. Excellence is proactive. 
You look for problems and you solve those problems. You don't wait for somebody to tell you. So when I was telling Dre that earlier, don't do what everybody tells you to do. Do what you must do. <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is I'm obviously if you work for somebody, you do what they tell you to do. But if you have to wait for them to tell you, then you're a very low level worker. Make sense? You got to figure out how to do it. You got to problem solve. Make sense? If you're nervous about taking action, then you just go talk to your leaders. Hey, these are my ideas. What do you think? Let them give you some insight. You know what I mean? Or if you feel like you're aimless, go to your leaders. Say, look, I, I want to do more, but I don't know what to do. See what I'm saying? Go seek for direction. Make sense? So excellence, it pulls it from self. Okay? <clears throat> You become too critical when the people you're trying to lead cannot be excellent within themselves. Does that make sense? You will only become too critical when the people that you're leading cannot be excellent within themselves. Okay? <clears throat> also, a better way to cultivate a culture of excellence is to not come through there and start telling all the things that are wrong, is to ask a simple question. What's wrong with this picture? Right? What's wrong with the picture? You tell me, how can this be improved? That causes people to pull from within themselves and say, okay, where's the problem? Obviously, Zach sees the problem. I don't see the problem. Or I haven't solved the problem that I've seen that he sees. See what I'm saying? One of the two, right? So just a simple question. What's wrong with this picture? I don't know if you guys, if I told you guys this story or not, but when I took private lessons <clears throat> uh, for trombone, I would have a private lessons teacher teach me and he'd always, we'd, he'd say, okay, play this piece of music here. So we start playing the piece of music and then he'd go down and he'd start telling me what I did wrong. He'd go through and go through and go. He did that for a season. Then one day, one of the most powerful questions he ever asked me, I played a little lick of music, and he goes, what'd you do wrong? You tell me. And my brain just went, ding. I thought to myself, I don't know. I don't know what I did wrong. He goes, we'll play it again. So I played it again, and now I was paying attention to my work. Came <laughs> I was so dependent on the nurse, <laughs> and when I got pulled off, you know, then I'm like, wah! <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, now I don't know what to do. Well, you gotta have to hold your own cup, buddy. You know what I mean? You can't depend on your mother. <clears throat> so when you, ask the, when you ask the question, you tell me what you did wrong. You tell me how it could be improved. So then I played the music again, and I, then I—it's like when you play basketball, and you know you shoot the sh they shoot, you shoot that shot, and as soon as it leaves your hand, you already know you're gonna miss the basket, right? Because you can tell, you can tell the way you threw it, you can tell the way I left your hands. Ah, dang it! Before it even hit the rim, you can already, if you if you play it enough, you know you can start telling those things, right? So it's the same thing. I play that music, and I'm like, man, yeah, okay, I did I did this wrong, I did that wrong. Good job. We'll go ahead and play it again. So there came a point where I was teaching myself. You know what I mean? Yeah. Starting to find the problems with my own work. Teaching yourself that spirit of excellence. So this is what I, this is what I want to challenge you guys to do. Not, and I'm not saying be rude. What's wrong with this picture? I'm not saying that. <laughs> no, seriously, like if you love somebody, you're trying to coach them and encourage them. All right, you tell me. What do you think you're doing wrong? It's one of the things we do in our in our one-on-ones. I ask the question. So what do you think you're doing good? What do you think you're doing bad? You know, what do you think needs to be improved? And oftentimes I'm not there to, to watch what they're doing. So I really don't know. I'm expecting my leaders to tell me what could have done better, what they could have done better this time. You know what I mean? And here's the cool thing about that is if you can teach your leaders how to do that, how to say those things to themselves, you don't have to meet with them as often. Because they're already doing it. 
they already start doing it to themselves. Make sense? All right, cool. I'm helping my leaders a little bit. So when you're trying to help somebody understand something, it's leaving me again. Golly, this is so important. Okay, here we go. An effective communicator doesn't just talk. He seeks to understand, okay? So if I'm, if I'm listening to someone, like I was trying to listen to him, right? Uh, and then I forgot what I was going to say. Um, so an effective communicator is really trying to listen to what's in your heart, okay? Because if I just talk and it doesn't go in, there's no point. I might as well just talk to that post over there. You know what I'm saying? But if I understand you, and I, or I'm trying to understand you, where you're coming from, how you're thinking, then I can effectively speak to you and help you grasp something, right? So questions are so important. This is why it's so, so important to ask lots and lots of questions. If you're not, um, <clears throat> and the reason why I said all this is because, again, um, as a leader, you're trying Oftentimes, as leaders, we're trying to, in, as leaders, okay. There's two approaches as leaders. Can either be a salesperson, okay, or they can be a coach, okay? A salesperson, and a leader who's a salesperson, is trying to convince you to do what you want, what they want you to do, okay? What I got is I have an idea that I want and I'm trying to convince you to also want what I want, okay? That's a salesman. That's your used car salesman, okay? He, he wants to sell you the car. He doesn't really care what car you buy. He just wants to sell you a car, okay? Now, uh, uh, now... Uh, well, he wants to sell you the, the really sleazy ones, just want to sell you the best, the, the, the most top dollar one, okay? But a good salesman, because even you can do this for sales too, a good salesman isn't going to try to put you in a car that you don't really want or need. It's going to put you in a car that you need, not what you want to sell. Right, right. You're, yeah, you're right. He, I, I can't tell you how many times. Okay, so we went down to the, the Keith uh, hardware store over in, um, where is it? Killeen? And she's like, yeah, just get me six everything. I said, hold on a minute. You don't want six to everything. I mean, I'd love to make that sale, but I'm not going to sell you six to everything because you don't need six to everything. Here's what you need. If you want six to everything, I'm going to give you six of all the ones I know for a fact you're going to sell, and then I'm going to customize the rest of your order. So if you'll just trust me, I'll just do it. Obviously, they trust me. They want to buy six to everything. So <clears throat> I just went in there and modified it, and I took out some that I didn't think they were going to sell much of, but I might as well try it, right? So I put the thing in there. And so what did that do whenever I did that? It lost me initial sales, but it got me four more accounts with three or four other hardware stores because they knew that I wasn't just trying to mess them over. You know what I'm saying? So a, a, a good, so we have a, the one minute salesman book. If you ever read that book, there's one, there's a one minute salesperson. And he goes, why call him a salesperson instead of a salesman? Because a person, he, he, his wording is, uh, a person is because like, you're a real person. You're not just trying to sell something to somebody. You know what I mean? You're trying to develop a relationship and you want to make sure that that person really needs what you're selling them. I'm not going to sell you what I need. Yeah. And this is the problem with all kinds of leaders. They're always trying to sell somebody on what they want. But a real people developer doesn't do that. A real people developer developer finds out what you want and helps you get that. Now, in the Christian faith, we're, what we're trying to do is we know that everybody needs Jesus, so there's no question in that, Amen. right? <clears throat> but at the same time, if I try to control everybody here and say, I know, okay, if, what if every student that came in here they came here the first week and I looked at them and said, you're called to the ministry and you're called to be here at the barracks. You know what that would be? Manipulative. That's not God. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> what I'm supposed to do, if I actually care about them and actually care about their calling in life, 
Because the fivefold ministry, the scripture says, is here to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That means that you have a ministry totally separate from mine that might be joined with mine or it might not. And if I'm actually going to be a good leader, I have to be okay with that. That makes sense? So a real good leader is going to say, let me develop you and your specific giftings and your specific calling. And if that is here, well, praise God. But if it's not, then I'm just going to develop you and send you away. And there's a scripture over in Ecclesiastes that says, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1. It says, cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Let me change the translation to the NLT. It says, send your grain across the seas, and in time profits will flow back to you. What is this? It is the principle of gaining by losing. If I want to win in life, I have to be willing to lose. Jesus says, he who seeks to gain his life will lose it. He who seeks to lose his life will gain it. This is the principle of developing people. If I develop people, I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to control them or keep them. I'm trying to develop them and release them into their calling. If their calling's here, guess what? They'll flourish. If it's not here, they will fail. I will fail. We'll all suffer. I don't want you here if you're not supposed to be here. <laughs> Make sense? Cool? Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1. You can see it up there. Send your grain across the seas and in, profit, and in time profits will flow back to you. This is the, the same principle as tithing. If I tithe, I'm sacrificing something Amen. and God is faithful to, be, to bless me for it. Okay, But I'm not just tithing to get something back. I'm tithing in faith, not knowing how it will come back. You see what I'm saying? The same thing when you develop people. If you truly want to be a good influencer, a good leader... You have to learn how to develop people and release them, okay? And somebody spoke this over, to, over. He didn't speak this scripture to me one time, but he told me about two years ago. He said, Zach, I told him, I said, I'm so frustrated because at the time I kept on developing people and they kept on leaving. <laughs> I was like, I'm never going to grow anything. Like, how can we grow if I keep developing these leaders and they keep on going? There's a guy named uh, Walton, uh, the guy who, who founded Walmart, became one of the richest men in the world. He told his, uh, he told his um, assistant uh, leader, whatever it was at the time, XO, CEO, whatever you call him, he, he said, uh, we've got to develop our people. He goes, so his, his second in command says, what if we develop them and they leave? He goes, well, what if we don't develop them and they stay? <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I remember telling um, my uh, this guy. He actually is over finances and stuff for Victory Life Church over in Durant. He ended up. Uh, I told him about our situation. I kept. I said I keep developing leaders and they keep leaving. And I'm so frustrated. He goes, but I just told him of several miracles, financial miracles, how how we had sown and God had provided. And he told me, he said, Zach, the same faith that you have for your finances, you also need to have for your leaders. You keep on sowing money, and then God sends you this money. So we, we gave away like $1,200 one day, um, all in one day, when we were like really in a bad, bad, bad situation. We made $4,000 in four days, okay? So <clears throat> I actually overdrafted the account, had only $6 in my own bank account, this crazy, crazy miracle. And ever since that day, I've been with, I've always had a, a full paycheck, and before that, I didn't. Okay, so like I was telling these cool miracles how I would sow and then God would bless us financially. He says the same faith that you have for finances, you need to have for developing leaders. He says you just keep on developing and keep on sending and God will send you your own leaders that are called to be there with you. And I got two guys back that I sent out, and they, came, they literally did come back. And the other three were developed somewhere else. They come here, and I'm still developing more now, but, but I didn't start from the bottom, you know what I mean, with those guys, you know what I mean? Uh, they had already had something put in them before they came, you know what I mean? So five of my leaders right now are, and Dre too, 
<clears throat> uh, they came back, you know what I mean? So, or they were sent from somewhere else. So that truth, that, that scripture came true, to, true in my life already. So anyway, it is not a short game. It's a long game. Hmm. All right, I better stop. Because <clears throat> it requires you walking with someone. That takes months. Months, years. Years, yeah, not days. Yeah. And what I found was that God gave me the capacity to lead because I was faithful with what I did and I also worked on personal leadership, reading tons of books. Then when I did get these other three guys here that I didn't develop from the beginning, and they came, guess what? I was able to actually pour into them and take them to another level. See what I'm saying? And of course, now these, anyway, but I hope that all my compliments aren't making other people feel inadequate or, you know, <laughs> don't, don't, we're all on a journey and we're all working together and you can also have the same story, so. Um, <laughs> yeah. Praise God. All right, cool. Thank you guys for watching. I hope this teaching blessed you and, and inspired you and helped you out a little bit. Man, if, th if it was a blessing for you, please uh, share the video, like it, leave a comment if you have questions. I'll, be, I'll try to answer these questions and whatnot. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Go to our Facebook page and make sure you've already liked the page. Hover your mouse over following and make sure C first is checked. If there's a check mark there, then you know that you'll be seeing our videos in your newsfeed. Also, if you're wanting to support our ministry and help fund missions work and help uh, support drug and alcohol recovery, please go to our website, boldestalignedministries.com or www.balmzs.com and you'll see here there's a donate button. You just hit this donate button right there. It'll give you an opportunity to, to sow into the ministry. Right there, you can see Bold as Line Ministries. You can give 30 bucks a month, $50 a month, or $100 a month, or just a one-time gift if you want. Also, you can go to our website, 3rcandles.com. Remember, all the candles are are handmade by our students in recovery and so you can select from our wide range of products I mean we just have tons of candles you can see right there and also be sure to sign up for the VIP offers we can get 25% off your next purchase you'll be able to receive offers we have we're also gonna be doing some free test strips for fragrances as well so make sure that you sign up right here and, and all that good stuff so have a good day